Ty, um, you, you're a CIO or Chief Innovation Officer at the Inspire Planner, and you're going to show us um, something about project management, the best practices, and of course, uh, see how we can use that because Salesforce, you know, the platform does a lot of things, but not actually um, have anything for, for project management. Uh, so I'm looking forward to um, which solutions and uh, best practices uh, you can share. Sounds great. Thanks, Andre. And uh, thanks to everybody else from uh, the Amsterdam user group. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, this is my first time participating in the, in the user group. So um, I do appreciate um, getting the invitation, but also the opportunity to share um, my knowledge and, um, and the content today with, uh, with such a, a great uh, audience. So today, um, the, the focus will be around best practices for effective project management in Salesforce. Um, just a little bit of background of, of, about myself. Um, so about 15 years ago, I started out as a um, consult, Salesforce consultant, basically managing Salesforce implementations. Um, throughout the course of my career, I've done large scale Salesforce implementations into big banks, um, as well as, you know, small implementations into uh, local nonprofits. So a very wide range of, of experience in terms of implementing Salesforce. And what was common throughout all those different implementations was project management and requiring to manage those projects effectively to deliver um, quality projects and, and quality solutions. Um, in addition to that, I've uh, spent uh, a few, uh, a number of years working um, for a couple of ISV partners as well. So during that experience, um, working as a, a solution architect and, and uh, application designer. So today, what I've done is I've, I've married that work experience between you know, solutions architecting and application designing and, uh, and all the project management experience and essentially co-founded Inspire Planner. So Inspire Planner, we have a, a native Salesforce uh, project management application um, that I'll look to show you a little later on in, um, in, in the presentation and how it can be used to facilitate some of these best practices for project management. Um, so first off, just, uh, from an agenda perspective, what I'd like to do is start into just the theory behind project management before we get into the actual, um, you know, actioning of those best practices in Salesforce. So what I'm going to first start off with is, um, this common theory that's available out there called the, the triple constraints theory. And what that theory is, is that. Um, we essentially have three components or levers within projects that we need to manage. And these are boundaries or constraints that we, we have at our fingertips as project managers in order to um, execute a project. And that would be scope, time, and cost. So these three levers combined, based on how we balance these levers, will ultimately result in the quality uh, of, of the project that we deliver on. So what I'd like to do is um, essentially touch upon each one of these elements and dig a little deeper into what they mean. Before I do that, just to, to highlight the theory a little, a little further, essentially the concept is that um, with every project, we have to manage, as I mentioned, these three levers. And as the project changes, if, as it deviates, as we learn new problems or, or encounter issues, we are going to use these three levers or these three components to manage how we resolve those issues or problems. So it, the example would be scope. So scope is what are we delivering on the project? So if something in the scope changes, if we, as we go through the, the project, learn that, you know, as we're transforming this visual force page into a lightning component, I didn't consider this, I didn't consider that, and I didn't plan for that, that means the scope now has potentially changed. So if that scope changes, how am I going to deliver the project on time based on the original estimated timeline? Well, the theory is that I can add cost or resources to it, right? So um, essentially I can uh, hire some additional developers or take, take somebody else from my team and apply more resource time to address that scope change so that I can maintain that, time, that original timeline. Or if I don't have that option and I can't, I don't have any additional resources and I don't have any additional money to spend on outside resources, then it's inevitable that the time will slip 
because again, the original time that I had planned was based on the original scope or deliverables that I had planned for. So there's this push pull effect. So essentially, if you look at these three components as levers, as one lever changes or gets pulled, a, another one has to give. And so you're balancing those three levers as you go through and execute your project. Okay. However, we need to consider that this theory doesn't apply always to all scenarios within projects, right? Um, it's, it's more of a guideline and a, and a core principle. However, there's going to be situations where um, you do discover the fact that, um, the, that you know, there is an issue or there's something new that you have to address and you can't just uh, apply more resources to it because those resources just don't exist. And so you can't solve that problem by one of these levers. Um, so again, it's, it's one of those core principles that you wanna exercise and apply, but it's not gonna apply in all scenarios. So let's go through and let's dig down a little deeper into each one of these components and identify what they mean, okay? So scope. So this is one of the most important. Well, they're all important, but um, I would say scope is um, what you're identifying as the goal or the set of deliverables that you're going to be executing or, or, or delivering on at the end of the project, right? So how do those goals or deliverables get defined? Well, first you have to just start out by defining clear and concise requirements. So from the stakeholder perspective, what are the requirements they're needing from this project to be delivered, right? And the example could be, we need to uh, migrate or convert to Lightning. Um, as, as one example. Now we need to ensure that when we identify or capture these requirements, they're very specific and concise so that we're defining the boundaries of what it is that we're gonna be delivering as a project team, right? And when you say, you know, migrate or convert to lightning, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm just enabling light and creating lightning pages? Does it mean I'm enabling a certain set of new lightning features? Does it mean I'm converting visual force pages that we have today into lightning? So really you need to be clear and concise around what the business requirements are and then translating those into tangible deliverables that you will be delivering on at the end of the project, right? What's important about this is that as you define these deliverables, you're also doing yourself a favor as a project manager and defining the boundaries of what you're delivering on. Because as we all know, as we're going through and delivering on these um, these needs of, of stakeholders, you know, we're going through and implementing configurations or developing new pages, et cetera. They're going to come and say, okay, well, does it do this or does it do that after the fact? Because they don't know what they don't know. And as they start to see tangible results, new ideas and whatnot are going to come up. And that's where you need to go back to the original deliverables definition to say, well, based on the original scope of our project, this is what we we're delivering. And if you wanted to add these additional items, it's going to impact either time or cost, right? So having that clear definition up front is going to allow you to always go back to that definition and manage what the, what, what the deliverables will be and allow yourself to set those proper expectations to your stakeholders. Now, as you go and you document all these deliverables that are required for the project, then what you can do is sit back and say, okay, well, how can, you know, can my organization handle all this change and all the work that's required to deliver on these deliverables? Because conceptually it's, you can go and plan a project and say, yes, I can get it done with these resources and then you deliver on it. But then, you know, say you roll out lightning, can my organization, can my users adapt to this change and can they adapt to it this quickly? And can they adapt to these many new features? So you yourself as a project team can deliver, you know, scope, cost, time effectively, but then when the net result is delivered to the stakeholders, if, the org if, if, if those stakeholders aren't able to receive them and adopt them and, and handle them to, the, to that capacity, then it ultimately will still be a failure. So it's always really important. Oftentimes, you know, being Salesforce professionals, we're implementing new features, new functionality um, it's going to involve change in the organization. So it's always a great question to ask yourself, can the organization handle this level of change? And that may mean just scaling back scope, extending time to deliver the project. So the organization has a longer amount of time to do UAT, or they have a longer amount of time for training, um, et cetera, et cetera. 
So really taking that into consideration. And then lastly, having the stakeholders sign off on what those deliverables are. So this is really important because again, you're setting the appropriate expectations up front. The stakeholders have a document, they're reviewing it. It's clearly identified what you're gonna deliver on and then they're signing off on it. So again, if then later on, as you're delivering the project, if the scope changes or if resources or cost change, you always have a document to go back to, to say, hey, this is what we originally agreed on. If you need something different, we need to then change one of the other elements of the project to deliver on that. Okay. So the next, the next lever or, or component is time. And time is gonna be the schedule uh, for the project delivery, right? And as part of that delivery, um, and, and in order to figure out what that schedule for delivery is, you as a project manager really need to build out a, a, a activity plan or work breakdown structure. So what that is, is gonna be all those different tasks and activities that you yourself and the overall project team need to perform to deliver on those specific deliverables that you've de defined and committed to. Now, what's key here and what's really important is, that is the completeness factor. You wanna ensure you take your time to build out and identify all the necessary tasks to achieve those deliverables um, successfully so that as you go and you plan your resources, right, to deliver on that, uh, all those tasks and activities, and then determine how much time it's going to take, you have a complete set of tasks that you're identifying um, throughout, throughout your schedule, right? And, and you only know what you know, and there's, there's going to be moments where you learn things that you don't know throughout that. And that's where, again, you're using the triple constraint theory to say, okay, well, there's a new task that's come up that I didn't plan for. Now I need to balance that by saying, okay, well, I need to reduce some scope or I need to add resources, et cetera, or just accept the expectation that this is something new that's changed. It's going to take a little longer to deliver the project. What's also key as you build out your plan or work breakdown structure is that you're building in task dependencies. So identifying in your project plan or project schedule, what dependencies tasks have on each other so that there's your, your, the plan that you're managing to is one holistic plan where the tasks themselves are pushing and pulling and impacting each other and showing you that impact immediately, as opposed to, um, you know, having a task list on a spreadsheet and then you have a delay in one task, you're not going to un understand how that delay will impact the, the, the downstream tasks within the project. And, you know, what does that mean for resources? What, what does that mean for uh, time, the timeline and the schedule, et cetera? So, um, and, and I'll show you a little later on in, um, within Inspire Planner how you can build these task dependencies together so that you can immediately see the impacts of changes within the project, which is extremely important. And then as you build out your schedule, you're determining how long each task is going to take and who's going to be performing that work. It's important to really consider um, what are all the blackout periods for, for that plan. So that's not only, you know, holidays and vacations. And that's, I, I just put that there. It's obvious, but if you're managing a global project where you have resources um, that are you know, working in different geographical areas, this becomes more important because different people uh, of different uh, countries will have different vacation uh, and, and different, uh, different holidays, et cetera. So just something to be aware of and incorporate that into your plan. And this is the one that's more important that that's um, maybe often less considered are the, the busy times within the organization itself. So for example, if you have tasks planned for uh, month end or, or fiscal year end, when organizations are extremely busy during that time, focused on other priorities, um, you need to be realistic around um, how much work can get done during that time. Um, or if you work um, within a, an app uh, a software company, maybe there's a release that's coming out in the next month. That generally is a busy time within the organization. How much focus and attention will the resources have during that time? So again, just being realistic and being aware of the busy periods so that you can plan and incorporate the, the appropriate contingency for those tasks at that time. And this is somewhat related, but consider the resources that you have on your, your, your project team and 
understand what other commitments they have. So it's essentially, what is their focus on the project? Um, oftentimes you have this general assumption that if somebody is on your project, that's their, their number one priority, which is usually not the case if they're part-time on the project and they have their day jobs that they're needing to work on, if they have um, just busy schedules in, in general. So um, it's again, being realistic there and understanding that I may have to build in extra contingency for my CFO because he's super busy all the time. And I have you know, these tasks assigned to him. Uh, they should be done in two days, but knowing his schedule, they'll be done in four days. So working in the appropriate contingency and padding for those realistic li uh, real life scenarios. Okay. Uh, next is the, the last component, which is cost. And cost is often um, interchanged with resources. So this is around the, the financial or budget constraints of the project. And the, 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 con, the budget constraints can be around, um, you know, material costs, what you need to spend on uh, materials, but also resource costs. So if you have budgets to hire external developers or subcontractors, et cetera, um, or maybe it's internal, internal resources that you're using. And so that constraint or budget will be resource time. Okay. So that's why I'm just interchanging cost and resources here. So this is the, the resources you have to deliver on the work, essentially, the, deliver on the deliverables. So the, the key points here that we want to highlight would be clearly define the roles and responsibilities for each of the, the team members in, that, uh, in the project. So you would identify this in the project schedule so you clearly understand what type of resources you need right? So that you can clearly identify from a cost perspective, I will need these X number of resources for X number of hours or, you know, within my project because of this matrix that I've built out. And again, setting the appropriate expectations for those resources as well. So as your, you know, people are assigned to your project, you would be able to identify for each one of them, setting their appropriate expectations of these are your key responsibilities, these tasks, or these deliverables, et cetera. And then as you, you build out that, um, that matrix, you want to also incorporate the understanding of what is the requirement of the work versus the capability of that resource. So oftentimes um, you have to estimate how much time a task will take based on the resource, right? And so what you, what the, what you want to do is ensure that you're allowing that resource to estimate the time of the work that they're going to perform, as opposed to you trying to do that. What I mean by that is if you have a specific task to say, build an apex trigger, you may have X number of years experience it, and it may take you four hours to do that um, as, you know, as somebody who's leading the project, but the resource that you have assigned to that is a bit more junior and it's probably gonna take them longer because they have less expertise than yourself. So for you to just estimate four hours based on your own, um, your own abilities and what you estimated would take your, yourself to do that work would ultimately result in probably an inaccurate plan. So what's best is to have those resources actually doing the work, estimate the amount of time it's gonna take because at the end of the day, they're gonna be performing the work and committing to, to, to those estimates. So all in all, essentially trying to build as accurate of a plan as possible so that we can, again, set all the appropriate expectations for, for all that's involved. So now if we take all of those three pillars or levers and essentially um, as we manage and, 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 and juggle them, we ultimately need to focus on the quality of that execution, right? We need to ensure that regardless of how we manage this, the net result or end result of our project is gonna be one of high quality. So how do we do that? Um, so first off, we wanna ensure that we set the appropriate expectations, right? So, and that, that, that encompasses scope, time and cost, right? So uh, based on the, all, all those considerations that I, I mentioned beforehand, from a scope perspective, we're setting the appropriate expectations up front because we're having the stakeholders sign off on what those deliverables are. Everyone's committing to the same goals and deliverables for the end project. We're building a, a, 
a very specific and very precise plan or as spe 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 excuse me, as specific as possible so that we're setting the expectations not only from the stakeholder perspective of when the project will be delivered, but also from a resourcing perspective, letting them know exactly you know, what they need to do and how much effort and time that they have. And then just setting the right expectations around costs. And this is back again to the stakeholders. If you build a, a good, strong plan, you'll be able to justify to your stakeholders, it's gonna cost X um, or it's gonna need Y resources to deliver on this plan. And here's my justification. Look at, look at the amount of work and time required to do it. Okay. So building that realistic plan and schedule really supports the first, the first point. And I'm gonna show you. So what I'd like to do is kind of toggle into Inspire Planner now and show you from a best practice perspective, how we um, kind of support each one of these key, key bullets around quality of execution. So build a realistic schedule and plan. Let's just toggle over to Inspire Planner. And what we have here is what we consider a work breakdown schedule or a project plan. So as I mentioned within the plan, um, we wanna ensure the completeness of the plan. So having you know, all the different stages and phases of work and highlighting the key deliverables within there. And then within those deliverables, we're specifying what are the specific tasks within there and, and then who is the work assigned to. And in addition to that, we have the estimated duration. So how long from a calendar time perspective each task will take, but also if I scroll over, how much effort will it take, right? So how much actual working time for that resource will it take? So given this plan, we clearly can set expectations around the, uh, the, the tasks and activity and the quantity of work that's required. We can set the expectation around who is doing and, and performing that work and the overall timeline that we expect that work to take. Now, as I mentioned in the, the schedule part of, a, of the presentation, it's key to incorporate those dependencies across your tasks. So as you can see within our project schedule here, and the example I have is just a, the rollout to Salesforce Lightning here. What we're doing is under the predecessors column, we're connecting all the different tasks together from a dependency perspective. So we clearly can see, you know, what tasks are dependent on, on other tasks and which tasks will impact other ones following it. So now if there's any impacts or, or changes or deviations in our plan. So for example, this first task, which is gather requirements, if that's taking us longer than we had planned, because there's actually more requirements that we, than we anticipated, we can quickly drag that out and reflect the actuals. And as we drag that out, you can see clearly that it's immediately kind of pushed out all of the subsequent tasks that are dependent on that one task based on the way that we've built all of these dependencies. Now we immediately understand what the impact is of that change, right? And you can see with these red indicators, which tasks have changed. Um, what's great about this is now we can continue to manage those expectations from the stakeholder perspective, right? We can, we can now immediately see what the impact of that task is and now communicate that and roll that up. We can now go to the stakeholders and say, oh, you can see it's taken extra long for the requirements gathering. Um, it's going to push out the project by this, this much time. If you don't want that time to be pushed out, then we need to scale back on the scope of what we're doing. So some of these activities here, so maybe design or configure these pages for Lightning, we're gonna scale that back because we'll only uh, configure pages for 10 objects instead of 15, just so that we can roll out and launch our project on time. So having all these dependencies allows us to run through all these different scenarios and figure out um, how we can essentially manage the schedule in order to um, deliver the project on time, or we need to add more resources, or we simply have to scale back the scope of it. Yeah. Uh, next is team collaboration. So what's really important when you're you know, working through a project is you wanna ensure that your team is ultra efficient. And what that, what that requires is that your team's able to communicate 
rapidly and effectively, but also share uh, information and data. And just having your project in one centralized location in itself provides that, right? So everybody's logging into Salesforce, everybody's working off of the same plan, everybody's working off of the same expectation and updating it accordingly. So that, that data and that information is being fed to your, your, your team members in real time. Nobody's out of the loop, essentially, right? In addition to that, under files and notes, you can utilize um, standard Salesforce functionality here to share documents and files, apply notes. Um, so again, your team is up to speed and you're sharing information and data about your project in real time. Nobody is wondering where this document is. Nobody's wondering you know, where the status is of the current project. Everybody's working off of the same data and information in one centralized place. In addition to that, it's extremely important for them to be able to communicate in real time, right? If I have an issue with my task or I need to escalate something to the project manager, or I just need to reach out to, to another team member and ask them for some advice, et cetera. So here, what we're doing is leveraging Chatter. So within Chatter, for each specific project task, I can now launch that feed and communicate with my team in real time. So if I need any, any materials or if I have a question, I can simply just launch Chatter and start pinging my, my team members directly. And they would be emailed and notified in real time, right? As I, as I work through uh, and, and communicate and collaborate with my team, those team members also through Salesforce tasks, um, when you assign project work to your resources and your team members, this creates a corresponding Salesforce task for them. And so they can essentially be working through their Salesforce tasks. And in, that, in their Salesforce task records, they'll be able to see all that data and information as well. So again, consistent with the, the expectation or the requirement of data sharing and knowledge sharing and information sharing. So that resource in real time would have a component that shows them what are all the, the predecessor tasks. So the, what are all the tasks I'm waiting on or dependent on before I can start or finish my task based on those dependencies that I, I formulated in my project plan, right? Um, you can see this task doesn't have any predecessors, so I'm okay. I can, it's ready to start and I can start working on it right now. There's also a list of all the successor tasks. So I can see all the tasks that are waiting or dependent on, on my task in one way or another. You can see the dependency type here. Uh, this has waiting to start. This is what this task is what needs to start together with my task. So I can clearly see the dependencies of my team and who's waiting on me. And I can reach out and you know, chat and discuss with them accordingly via chatter as well, if there are issues. So it's that real-time collaboration, real-time conversation and knowledge sharing that is gonna allow not only you, the project manager to efficiently and effectively address problems, issues, uh, but also your team in real time as well, collaborating and solving problems together with you. Okay. Uh, next, managing risks and issues. So risks and issues. So these are, these are the um, kind of unexpected problems that are gonna come up during your project. Um, so as these issues and these problems come up, you need to be able to document and track them so that there is some sort of resolution for them. Even if there is no resolution for them, it's good to document and highlight them, again, to set the appropriate expectations for your stakeholders. Um, an, an easy way to do that would just be to link cases to them. So in my demo here, what I'm showing is that we, we utilize standard Salesforce cases. It's a great um, existing kind of standard functionality to do that because it's tracking you know, the owner of the risk, the, the number of days that that risk has been open, the priority, et cetera. So great functionality that exclusive, you know, that, that applies uh, nicely to, to risk. So being able to document them, being able to highlight them, again, sets the appropriate expectations for your stakeholders, for them to be aware that if this risk does come to fruition, you've kind of raised it when that risk came about, as opposed to reacting to it when it's already happened. Okay. Next is tracking the variance, um, tracking and variance analysis. Right, quick, so, quick question. Um, sure. All what you're explaining here on, on, on Inspire Planner, can I understand this is part of standard salesforce.com or this is a separate 
application uh, uh, within Salesforce? Uh, that's a great question. So this is a separate application um, that's available on the App Exchange. Okay, clear. Thanks. You're welcome. So tracking and variance analysis. So this is measuring, you know, how well you're executing to your original plan. And a great way to do that is establishing a baseline. So this is kind of taking a snapshot of your original plan so that you can see and understand how you're deviating from that original plan. So I can click the icon beside to show those um, baseline task bars, right? And so now as my project changes and deviates, if the example I used earlier is, okay, the requirements is taking longer than expected. Now this is pushing out all these other tasks by X number of days, right? Now I can start to manage my plan, right? I can manage the scope. I can manage the, the timeline um, and cost, et cetera, to say, okay, well, maybe what I can do is I can add more resources here and scale that back. I can start it earlier, et cetera. Maybe I uh, can shift this one back, et cetera. So it's allowing you to uh, play with all these different scenarios, essentially using those, those levers um, to try to either um, meet your original plan, uh, meet, meet your original schedule, or speak to the fact that you need more resources in order to achieve the impacts of, of those, um, those issues. Okay. And then lastly, leverage lessons learned. Um, and this is always important because, you know, we all know that we, as we go through and we deliver on a project, there's always surprises. You, you can only plan and manage for what you know, right? And there's oftentimes scenarios that come up where you don't know what you don't know. And it's, they're called learnings. Um, so as you learn through your process, you need to, um, what's important is after each project, you can run with your project team post-mortems where you can start to identify what are these key learnings um, and what can we do better next time? And you should be documenting that um, within some sort of repository within your system. But in addition to that, as you're managing all your projects within Salesforce, you can also then utilize all that data to run some trend reporting as well to identify data-driven learnings, right? So as I go through and I open up my, my dashboards, I can start to see, you know, I have all these projects that are, you know, in red overdue. So I can drill down and maybe I can start to see from a trend analysis perspective, are there commonalities within these projects? Oh, it's, you know, Ty's always the project manager. So maybe that's the issue is that um, he's, he's overworked or he needs to go take some, uh, some more project management classes. Um, it, it may be specific to client related work. It may be specific to a specific step in the process. So utilizing the data to trend that analysis to determine are there you know, consistent bottlenecks or consistent issues or delays across your projects, that data is gonna really help drive learnings as well and help you focus on those um, key areas uh, to improve. All right. So those were the key highlights um, I wanted to go through as, as part of our- um, May I ask our, a question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, can you show something about the uh, stopwatch functionality for time management? And uh, next question, how do you enable this on a mobile device? Oh, that's a great question, Paul. So um, first off, we have um, additional columns there, planned effort and actual effort. So this is how you would plan the, the, the work that's applied to your team and then measure how much work they, they've actually logged. So planned effort um, is the estimate time or the budgeted time. As your team logs their work, it would roll up into actual effort. So there's a couple of different ways for your team members to log their time. They can use on their Salesforce task, they can use this stopwatch feature. So they can initiate when they start their work, they can go off, do their work, come back. If they need to break for lunch, they can stop it and continue it. And they can also manually update the time here as well and log that. So that then logs a time entry against that specific task and rolls up back to your overall project's plan or schedule. 
they were also able to log their time through a time tracking component as well. So if they don't want to use a stopwatch, they can easily just click on the time tracking component, define the day that they want to log their time and just new entry and input the details. Okay. And we also have a weekly view as well, where you can just rapidly enter time if you prefer to do it that way. Or there's a bulk entry type interface under the time tracker that allows your team to, if they want to log time, say at the end of the day or at the end of the week, they don't like to log time on a task by task basis, they can do it right here within the time tracker. So it defaults to the weekly view, which will list out all the tasks that fall in that week where they can just rapidly enter time. Um, or they can again, use the daily view if they want to focus on specific days. Over on the left would be all the individual uh, tasks um, within projects that they're assigned to. So they would just pick a task and log it if they like. Yeah. And it actually allows you to log time against any other object or record in Salesforce. So if you want to log time against support cases or sales opportunities, et cetera, um, you're able to log time really against any. Well. any yeah. okay. And uh, what I see often with users is that they want to, um, I'm a Salesforce consultant, by the way, uh, what I see with my clients is that many users want to have a mobile device where they do, can do the time tracking and use the desktop for all the qualitative, let's say, assignments. Um, so my biggest question here is, do you provide this, this time tracking feature, especially the stopwatch? Do you provide this on, um, on mobile as well? So, so currently on mo mobile, we don't provide uh, the, the stopwatch functionality. Um, we have a uh, like a, a mobile action on Salesforce tasks where they just click click the button and log their time in that mobile action. Um, we we do have it in our roadmap for um, Q2 2021 to build in all of these mobile um, all of these time tracking features within within the mobile interface. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. My if pleasure. we already disturb uh, your presentation, we have another question from Chadar. Does it alert you of any upcoming tasks? Yes, absolutely. So when you are assigning tasks to your team or your resources, they're essentially just Salesforce tasks. So it behaves the exact same way as you know creating a Salesforce task for your 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 team member. So it would alert them of the a new Salesforce task has been assigned to them. And also the Salesforce tasks have that reminder feature where it would pop up, right, as a, as a ribbon uh, up at the top, letting you know that a new ta this task is uh, due to start or, or due today. And in addition to that, you're able to utilize Salesforce configuration to send or create additional alerts and reminders and notifications, if you like. So, for example, if this checkbox goes to true when it's ready to start, you can have a custom uh, alert through a process flow fire and, and, and remind somebody that it's ready to start. So it's very flexible um, in terms of how you can, you can configure that. Thank you. My pleasure. Any other questions, folks? A uh, small question maybe, but it's from a developer point of view. Uh, do you support like Scrum with the story point stuff and all that? Uh, that's a good question. So we do have this, this agile view. So it, it provides you uh, like a more Kanban based view. So you would just structure the, the project as, you know, feature sprint, and then the various stories related to that. And then it could represent these fields and values here. However, if you're, if you would like to define say story points or other um, you know, custom attributes that we don't have out of the box, you can easily add them to just the, the task object. So if you configure um, those custom fields, we have a field set that allows you to just apply those custom fields into, um, into this view here. So it would show up as a custom column. So you could create a story point column, you could create um, a release column Etc. So it, it is very flexible in terms of how you can extend and configure uh, the application. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Uh, question on this topic, uh, uh, Ty, uh, Paul again, sorry. Um, 
if we would want to incorporate projects with many other uh, objects in Salesforce, then flexibility in the, let's say, the, uh, in the data model of the managed package is quite uh, important. Uh, and I see uh, apps that have very limited, uh, let's say, uh, manipulation options uh, and others have uh, uh, a lot. How would you consider yourself in this area? Yeah, that's a that's a great question, and uh, I would say we're very configuration extensible friendly. Um, so, the way that we've designed it, we want to definitely support the ability to extend it, um, integrate it with other automations, other customizations that you have. So, for example, um, you you know you our project object is a standard custom object. It's a managed package, but you can easily add you know other custom lookups. To other objects. So if you want to associate a project to an order or a case, uh, you can easily do that. Um, you can configure and manipulate the page layout. Um, we're just, you know, we're trying to leverage as much of standard Salesforce as possible in the solution as well, mm -hmm. so that it, it lends itself to allowing administrators to then go and configure it as much as, as possible um, based on their preference. Okay. Where, where are your limitations from a technical perspective where you say, okay, we don't allow this? Uh, so for example, within our interfaces, so if you go into our interface here, um, yeah, this Apex. interface is relatively yeah, cool. locked down. Like you can't add a custom icon here. You can't change the behavior. However, um, we do have a field set that does allow you to add your own columns. So if you wanted to configure different um different custom fields that you wanted to display in, in this interface. You can just create those custom fields and add them to our, our field set. And you can, you know, um, under the column section, you can control the view that you're seeing as well. You can define the different columns that you want to use or not use. Um, you can rearrange it, et cetera. But from a, yeah. you know, from a, okay. an app level, the app itself is, is relatively locked down. We've added um, some design elements like field sets to allow you to, to add to them, but you can't manipulate the core of what's there. Yeah, so don't manipulate the, the, the custom UIs, uh, but therefore you have some, uh, some wizard-like uh, stuff that you uh, show here. And for the rest, uh, the data model is, uh, can be reached. Okay, That's correct. cool. Answers uh, my question, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I just had a quick thank question you. regarding the timer. Um, does the screen need to stay open or does it just run simultaneously when you go into a, another task? Uh, it should run simultaneously. So it, it saves it as your user session. So if I navigate away and I go back, it should still be running. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you for that. Um, not sure if there's more questions, but let's. Um, we we have quite some time after the the, the next uh, section. Um, so of course, you know, keep asking the, the questions in the in the chat. Now we'll, we'll get back to those in uh, probably about five minutes. Um, but yeah, thank you. Time. And thank you, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank oh, you very pleasure. much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was uh, it was great. Also, especially like the, um, the, the framework you showed at the, the beginning, well, pretty much used the whole uh, presentation with the scope, cost, time, and, and quality. Uh, I also tend to use that in uh, a lot of pre um, projects. Very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. My pleasure.